Hello and welcome. To those joining us today live and on the web, it's great to have you here. My name is Gordon Davies, and I'm the program director for a diverse range of courses in languages and arts and science here at the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies. I'm happy today to host today's uh, engaging webinar presented by historian, curator, and school instructor Barbara Isherwood. Uh, today's session, which is part of our Realize Your Dreams webinar series, is a journey back in time to an intriguing part of medieval life. Barbara's talk will show images, she'll give commentary, and will be live video that will, question, that will include a question and answer period at the end. And her topic is mermaids in church. Those odd, unexpected pagan elements, figures, statues, and signs that are found inside Christian structures in medieval Europe. How did these pagan elements get there? What are they doing in churches? What meaning did they have for their makers and their admirers? Barbara Isherwood has curated exhibits and produced and hosted a radio program on the arts. She's published articles and essays on visual arts and contemporary craft in national and international publications. She's a recipient of the Ontario Craft Council's Critical Craft Writing Award, and she is also a host of Art Sync TV. Barbara, we're very pleased to have you here today. Thank you. So a few housekeeping items. I'm sure there are people in the audience who will have questions for Barbara. They can send in these questions throughout the presentation, and we invite you to do that. You can ask questions by email at this email address, scs.mediacontact at utoronto.ca, or by Twitter using the hashtag RYD2015. RYD for Realize Your Dreams, or by chat on YouTube through the right-hand side of the video window. And your questions will be gathered during the course of Barbara's presentation. Then at the end, we'll do our best to address them all. If there's some questions that we don't have time for, we'll make sure that you get an answer by email in a few business days. If you have any technical difficulties during the presentation that you cannot resolve by refreshing your browser, please call the telephone number in the webinar description below the video window. Somebody is staffing that telephone number and will be able to help you. So Barbara, tell us about Mermaids in Church. Okay, well it's my pleasure to be here. and. Um... I'm going to start off by saying a lot of what you're going to hear today is uh, conjecture because there's no hard written evidence. But I do have an excerpt from a letter that was written by uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, who was an important 12th century monk. He was the found founder of the Cistercian Order. And he founded this order because he felt like the uh, Cluniac monks were living too lavishly. And amongst the things he objected to was the way they decorated their churches and monasteries. And uh, so this is what he says about that. But in the cloister, under the eyes of the brethren who read there, what profit is there in those ridiculous monsters, in the marvelous and deformed comeliness, that comely deformity? Here is a four-footed beast with a serpent's tail. There, a fish with a beast's head. Here again, the forepart of a horse's tail trails half a goat behind it, or a horned beast bears the hindquarters of a horse. So many and so marvelous are the varieties of diverse shapes on every hand that we are more tempted to read in the marvel than in our books. For God's sake, if men are not ashamed of these follies, why at least do they not shrink from the expense? So I'm not sure. Bernard ever saw a mermaid, but I'm sure if he did, he would have just completely blown a gasket. So just in my introductory slide here, you can see a, a sweet little mermaid from um, a choir stall in the collegiate church of uh, St. Ursus in uh, Astoia, Italy. 
And uh, so here's a mermaid from 15th century England on a misericord, and I'm going to explain what misericords are um, in the St. Lawrence Church. And uh, you can probably see um, she's holding one object, and that would be a mirror. And uh, if she had another hand, she'd probably be holding a comb. So much uh, into appearances. So the reason I picked the mermaid uh, was because um, she's still very resonant, surprisingly so. Um, you can probably see uh, that the Starbucks logo that we see today um, has been quite toned down from the original logo, uh, which was um, based on a 16th century print. Um, and uh, Yes, after this presentation, look at the contemporary Starbucks logo and see if you can figure out that that actually is a mermaid. And uh, of course, the little mermaid, uh, but in both cases, these are contemporary images. I think we can see quite clearly that um, the mermaid is not exactly a wallflower. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is the mermaid and the green man. And we'll see that with the mermaid, there seems to be less controversy as to what exactly um, she meant in the context of a Christian society. So where is the mermaid found in uh, medieval Europe? Well, you can find her in churches, on uh, carved capitals, painted on the walls, in floor mosaics, and in illuminated manuscripts, including in Bibles. And uh, here's a lovely uh, two-tailed serpent. Actually, it's a, a twin, two twin mermaids here with the two-tailed variety um, from uh, a church in France from the 12th century. So where does the mermaid come from? Well, there's a long history of gods and goddesses that are part fish, part human being, going back to at least around 7,000 BCE. Um, I'm focusing on the, uh, the female version, so the um, fish goddess. So here we have an example from ancient uh, Syria, a goddess named Dirkato. And uh, you can probably see that she's got, um, you know, top half of a woman and bottom half of a fish here. And she was associated with um, um, wealth of the oceans and the fisheries, and she was seen as a, a beneficent goddess, and also with fertility. So fertility goddesses often um, would have um, either bottom house that were serpents or snakes, <clears throat> because snakes were associated with the earth, and the earth is a place of fertility. And just another example, um, Eurydice, who was uh, one of the, the minor gods of um, goddesses of ancient Greece, uh, possibly the daughter of Oceanus, and you can see that she was also presented in a form that we would describe as a mermaid. So top half woman, bottom half fish, and this is actually from a, a, a medieval book called Images Depicting Gods of the Ancients. So other uh, half-woman, half-creatures uh, from the ancient world would include um, Scylla, or Scylla, who was a sea monster who used to prey on um, sailors. And the siren, and so the word siren is sometimes used in the same context as mermaid. And the original sirens, according to Greek legend, were actually half woman, half bird. And they had a beautiful, beautiful voice, and they would sing to the sailors, and the sailors would be lulled by their sound and fall asleep. And the next thing you know, the sirens would be upon them. So at some point, the siren seems to have um, morphed in the early, um, or sort of early Christian, late antique period um, into something that was a half woman, so a half woman and half fish. So she kind of loses her bird form. 
Just another example from ancient cultures, this is um, the mix of Parthenos, which means the half maiden um, from the ancient Ukraine. And uh, you can see that she's the, what they call the bicaudal mermaid. So she's got two tails. And uh, I just thought it was quite striking when you look at the, you know, something like this here and um, a version that appears uh, in the mid-6th century in a Christian church. So this is a floor mosaic in the Cathedral of, of Pesaro. And uh, you can see that, that it's sort of the same idea, the uh, mermaid or siren holding up her two tails. And originally, the uh, mix of Parthenos was described as the, the legendary mother of the Scythians. So what does she mean when she, when she turns up in a, in a cathedral? This is, the, this is the question. Just one more, uh, one more possible source. Um, this one, a little, possibly a little more contemporary with the medieval period. Uh, the legend of Melusine. And Melusine was um, a woman who every Saturday uh, became uh, half woman and half serpent. And the serpent is variously just described as, as like the bottom half of a fish or the bottom half of a snake. And uh, what's happening here is she, she married someone and he had to promise that he'd never break in on her when she was having her bath on Saturday. And uh, he did do that, and he discovers that Melissine is actually um, not what she had appeared. So this is a, a, um, a book that may have had earlier sources, but it was um, collected into a written group of tales in the 14th century. So very much around the same time that we find all these mermaids appearing in, in the church. Uh, so here we have a medieval manuscript demonstrating the mermaid um, doing her worst. So um, uh, Guillaume Leclerc describes how um, she sings to the sailors. And you can see this one's already just kind of nodded off here. And here's the mermaid holding her mirror and her calm symbol of pride and vanity. And in general, she's you know, considered um, a representation of, of the, the sin of lust. And sometimes you'll see her holding a fish, which is usually interpreted as, um, you know, representing a human soul that she's caught. So here she is in a, a bestiary. So a bestiary would be an encyclopedia of, of creatures, a real and imagined, and of course the boundaries between those two worlds were much less fixed in the medieval period where people thought, you know, maybe there were mermaids out there. So you can find mermaids on uh, paintings in church walls, those that still exist. A lot of paintings, unfortunately, were, um, especially in England, were whitewashed during the Reformation. But this is actually a really early example of a painted cycle from around 1100 in, in church. So it's the, uh, the two-tailed mermaid here with her uh, musical instrument getting ready to uh, attract some sailors. And uh, here's an absolutely beautiful one on the ceiling of Exeter Cathedral. And if, if you're going to go mermaid hunting in England, I suggest you bring binoculars because Exeter Cathedral, like the other ones we're going to be looking at, is a Gothic cathedral. And the idea was to make the ceiling as high as you possibly could. Um, and so if you're just standing there looking up, it's very, very difficult to see um, these things. So bring a pair of binoculars if you can. And maybe you will see the mermaid here just waiting to catch you off guard. So here we have um, a mermaid uh, in Cardinal Priory Church in Lancashire. And she is carved onto a misericord. And I thought I would show a few different examples from misericords, just because um, it's interesting that the mermaid is, is such a popular item 
because misericords were generally only seen by the monks. So you have to think that the audience for this particular form of mermaid um, was the clerics only. So I'll explain what the misericords were and where you find them. But I just want to point out her typical attributes. See, she's got her comb and her mirror, and she's the, the bicaudal, which was particularly salacious. Um, yeah. You find a lot of images of acrobats in churches, and uh, sometimes they're they're sort of pulling their legs open in this kind of exhibitionist um, stance, and so the mermaid is kind of the mermaid in this form was seen in that context. She's got quite a beautiful uh, head of hair. So misericords are easy to miss if you're walking through medieval churches in England because um, they're actually carved under, I think the misericord itself is a little seat that is under a seat in a church stall. So this is what the seat looks like when you're sitting down. But in the medieval period, um, the monks had to stand while they were singing and uh, reciting the, um, the divine office. And that could actually be for hours they had to stand. And so as a some concession to comfort, they designed these little, almost like little ledges. So when you put the seat up, what you get is a little ledge, and you can see in the side view here what it looks like. So you would sort of, you know, perch your um, behind if you were a monk on here. And then this is the element that is carved. And the fascinating thing about misericords is there's very little religious imagery. The majority of it is secular, and it can range from things like um, uh, labors of the month um, to the most fabulous um, feasties. And there's at least 30 mermaids, if not more, in England. And then you also find them on these airports in, in Italy and in France. So here's uh, three, um, one from France at the top here, uh, one from Germany, and another one from France. And so you can see that the basic iconography in each of these is the same. It's the one-tailed mermaid with her mirror and her comb. But in each case, the carver has been given you know, probably some instructions as to this is what it's to be, but then has been allowed to carve it within his own style because as many of these as you look at, they all tend to be quite different. So probably what they would have gone by would either have been another one that they'd seen someplace else or something in a medieval manuscript or even a pattern book. Um, and, um, Sometimes you still read people saying, oh, well, this was the carvers having fun and nobody was going to look at these so they could just do anything that they wanted, ha, ha, ha. But the carvers weren't paying for these. And as we know from St. Bernard's complaint about how much money was spent on church decoration, hiring you know, skilled carvers to create this kind of work was expensive. And so there's, it's very unlikely that the subject matter wasn't um, ordered by the clerics. And some have actually suggested that maybe the person who sat in that stall even was allowed to kind of suggest, you know, well, I like a mermaid. I'll just show you a couple more here. These are all from England, one from Carlisle Cathedral, one from Chichester, and one from Holy Trinity. Um, and you can see in each case, um, it's the same iconography as so, you know, the mermaid with her mirror. And she's this little sweet little one here has lost her hand, but she probably had a comb in it. And this one actually is wearing a cap. So you can see there's a little bit of variety. So what does it all mean? Well, I think within the context of, of 
the range of subjects you find in misericords. I would put this one in the women behaving badly category. And if you think about who's the intended audience, well, it's monks. Well, first of all, it's probably not a bad idea to discourage them to have any thoughts about, um, gee, maybe I made a mistake here. <laughs> um, and uh, also, like the broader context of keeping women in their place uh, within the medieval period. So just some other images that you find in churches that relate to uh, women behaving badly. Um, we've got the, the demon, uh, Tudulus, and his job was to record the words of women gossiping in church. You can see with these two ladies here, they don't actually realize that he's there, and they're looking kind of at each other instead of at the person who's uh, reading the sermon right now. And so he's writing down what they're gossiping about, and this will be presented to them on the Day of Judgment. And another image that you find um, in a number of visit courts throughout uh, England is uh, images of domestic strife. And it's usually the woman who's got the upper hand. So this one was actually shown to me uh, last year when I was in Westminster Abbey. Um, the man who's giving the tour um, pointed this one out. So it's a woman birching a man, which involves whacking his rear end with a bunch of um, saplings. So you can, you can see that here she is, and she's got her saplings, and she's grabbed his chemise and pulled it up, and she's about to give him a whack. So sometimes this is also seen as a symbol of the world turned upside down or the topsy-turvy world. And of course, here's the absolute worst, worst offender. This is the dishonest alewife. So she's the woman who would be watering down your beer at the local tavern. And uh, here she is um, being slung over the shoulder of a demon. And here she is, you can see she's upside down. She's still hanging on to her tankard here. And uh, we've got a demon here who is writing down her misdeeds. And then these two are carrying her off and straight into the mouth of Hades she goes. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this, the dishonest alewife is a motif that you find in other places too. It's actually been discovered on, um, on uh, paintings in church walls. So women are to blame, can we say? Uh, sh the mermaid uh, keeps bad company. <laughs> so here she is with a couple of um, miscreants, um, some kind of a human-headed creature with wings and claws, and then a, a, a creature who was called a wyvern, who was, who was sort of a composite dragon type. And then here she is um, suckling a lion. And I've seen probably at least four different misericords with that motif, suggesting that she's the nurturer of the um, fierce, wild side of nature. Uh, so I just thought I would sort of conclude my, um, my section with uh, mermaids here. Um, showing that she wasn't necessarily always considered completely without merit. Um, this, is a, this is an amulet uh, that is worn in Naples. And you can see it's the bicaudal siren or mermaid. They call it a sirena. Um, and this is actually worn to ward off evil. And here's a sweet little mermaid who is on a bench end. Um, in a, a church in Norfolk, and there was a legend that this little mermaid had sought refuge um, in the church from a storm at sea, and uh, she's rather sweet. So um, I'm going to move on next to the green man. So as I said, I picked the mermaid and the green man because 
they continue to resonate with people. So here's a couple of examples of medieval green men. This one is uh, it's from another Visera court. Actually, it's from Cartmel Priory, which is where we had that splendid bipodal mermaid. And he's got the um, the triple faced um, features. So there's actually two two profiles, and then his uh, a third face in the center here. And then uh, a splendid, splendid roof boss. Roof boss. So the roof bosses are actually uh, decorative features that cover joints in the roof. And this one's from Norwich Cathedral. And um, a lot of these have actually been um, restored over the years um, because the idea of having uh, painted elements in church, especially in England. Uh, really kind of fell off during the Reformation when if there was anything that hadn't been smashed by Cromwell's troops. You know, you decided, well, let's not repaint it, and maybe they won't notice it's there. But I, I'm finding that a, a lot of the roof bosses actually have been repainted. And of course, they're wooden, so they're much more um, likely to decay if they're not repainted, unlike stone. So the green man is really popular these days. Um, he's defined by being um, a human and a nature hybrid. And you can, oh my gosh, you can find him in so many different places. He's often turned into garden ornaments. Um, here's a, a label from a craft beer. And if you think about uh, Tolkien's um, tree man creatures, the ants. This is just a few examples of, of the green man. He's been adopted by um, environmentalists and by Wiccans. And you frequently read about him being described as um, a pagan motif that the, um, you know, the artisans of the churches were building right under the noses of the church fathers. And there's actually um, no evidence to support that whatsoever, as far as I, I can see. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. But in terms of where the green man is, is found, well, there's literally, I would say, thousands of them all over Europe. They figure that there's at least 23 countries that have examples of green men. Uh, huge number in England probably at least a thousand, if not more. Um, many in France, in Germany, in Italy, and then you can see other countries. Um, here's one from uh, Latvia, and uh, one from Pisa. So there's lots of examples from the medieval period. And uh, you find varieties of forms, but the simplest kind of breakdown are the type that is referred to as the um, uh, disgorging or the spewing uh, green man, and that's the one where you see um, sprouts or leaves coming out of various orifices, often his mouth, but you can also sometimes see them coming out of his nose and out of his ears, and sometimes even out of his eyes. So here's three examples, uh, one from France, uh, one from Canterbury Cathedral in England, and one from um, a country church in Germany. You can see that you know they're actually each quite different in terms of uh, you know particularities of style, but the elements are the same. The you know the leaves coming out of the nose or the mouth, and these three are quite stylized, as in they're not naturalistic representations. The other type of green man is the what's described as the foliate head, and that is where you know the entire head or part of the head is made up of leaves. And so here's quite an early example from um, sixth century Byzantine, and uh, this is a medieval one uh, um, carved in wood of a foliate head. So in terms of their uh, their appearance and their general character, there's as I said, there's a lot of variety. They can be 
only just very remotely human. It's like this moon-faced green man, so extremely stylized. Or they can actually be quite naturalistic. Like this one here, this is a famous one in, in Sutton Vanguard in, um, in Wiltshire. Is a very naturalistic carving of a, a face who's been um, sort of um, covered by these by these leaves, and uh, the expressions can range from um, outright maniacal <laughs> to resigned and uh, possibly sad, angry. So there's a real variety within the form. And as to where they come from. This is where people start getting the, the boxing gloves out. Um, and it really, I think when you say there's pagan origins, what does one mean by that? So you can definitely find foliate heads in um, ancient Rome, for example. Um, various of the gods associated with natural forces, such as Pan or Bacchus. Um, or Dionysus um, will be shown as having you know, leaves emerging from their body. So this is a, a fountain mask of um, Oceanus, who's associated with um, salt water. And he's actually got some snails uh, growing out of his face, as well as seaweed. So this is one that is from the pre-Christian era. And then um, late antique, period. Um, this is one from Germany, but it's from a, a, a Roman Germanized um, uh, community at uh, Trier, where you can see it's that foliate head type. But it's interesting that a very similar head to this was uh, incorporated into a church around 500 um, um, by a bishop. So taking something that had pagan origin and intentionally putting it into a Christian church. You can find other examples of green men from, from you know, cultures really quite widespread. Um, there's, a, there's one from um, Mesopotamia that is um, in Iraq here from a time that would be contemporary with Hellenistic Greece. And here's one from a Jain temple in India. So some people have suggested that maybe, you know, travelers, um, crusaders coming back from other parts of the world brought these motifs. But there's also the possibility that people just have the same idea, you know, at around the same time. So there isn't necessarily a link there. And just uh, like I did with uh, Melusine, um, I wanted to find a couple of more contemporary sources. So around the same time as we're finding all these green men materializing, um, the story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is first published. Now it might have been an oral story that had much longer roots, but the Green Knight is um, uh, often seen as um, a figure representing the idea of, of, of rebirth um, because uh, Gawain lots his head off and then he comes back for more. So whether this was um, seen as something that we could connect with the resurrection or whether it was the idea that nature had to be subdued um, is uh, something that is being still debated. Um, we have songs like um, John Barleycorn, and I think if you hear the words to John Barleycorn, there was three men come out of the West, their fortunes for to try, and these three men made a solemn vow, John Barleycorn must die. They plowed, they sowed, they harrowed him in, threw claws upon his head, till these three men were satisfied, John Barleycorn was dead. So barley was what they made um, beer and whiskey from. So the idea of, of um, seasonal activities, pastoral activities. So just to briefly go through um, the many, many, many theories 
about um, the Green Man and um, his significance. Um, he's often seen as um, a symbol of um, resurrection, the idea of rebirth, um, and that of course has Christian context. So those are those are positive things. Um, there's also a view that the Green Man represents some reminder that we're all going to die, and that so that we should you know we should keep that keep an eye on the um, you know the end goal as we're living our life. Um, some have actually viewed him as a symbol of trapped souls, and um, also as possibly a device to ward off evil. And uh, one of the more interesting theories I've come across lately is that um, it's based on the Jungian idea of archetypes and that the green man arises when humankind and nature are out of sync. So that certainly chimes with what's going on today. Um, so here we have a couple of examples of the green man looking kind of sad. Um, perhaps representing the, um, you know, the figure that's been trapped uh, by his nature, by human nature, and that, you know, our, our natural impulses um, need to be tamed. But we also find a few examples of um, Green Man being a positive um, figure uh, where he is um, represented uh, beside a saint, so helping to carry the message, or here he is actually carrying the Virgin and Child, this is an example from, uh, from Exeter Cathedral. And uh, just to finish off here, um, a couple of examples of the green man as, as possibly a protective spirit, uh, especially in spots like doors, roofs, windows, any place where a structure was considered weak is where the, um, the bad spirits could get in. So here's a green man on the outside of a church in Spain. And you'll notice that there's a monkey beside him. So this is a place where you would have lots of different grotesque types of heads. Um, you know, the theory being that they would keep the bad spirits out. And here's one with some horns. So does this relate to some sort of, um, you know, long ago pagan god? And I'll just finish off with um, these images from Rosalind Chapel in Scotland, where there's about 100 green men. And uh, if you walk around the church, they seem to tell a story of a life with the youthful green man under a scene of the nativity. And then all the way around on the other side, the dead green man near a scene of the crucifixion. So I think there's no doubt that um, although he may have had um, you know, roots in uh, pre-Christian culture, that he became um, you know, a symbol that um, could be seen as a representation of resurrection and eternal life um, to God's blessing. And uh, there's a two-tailed siren to say uh, thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Barbara. That was fascinating. Um, what struck me the most was your comment um, that it relates to, to the Christian message, whether it's uh, by way of urging Christians to be more faithful or warning them uh, against being unfaithful. And I think that has huge relevance today, you know. Um, in parts of the world, especially the Middle East today, where there are some religious fundamentalists who believe that pagan cultures must be destroyed and their symbols uh, eliminated, here we see early religious artists who believe that 
pagan symbols could in fact be baptized. They could be brought into their religious symbols that God they believed was bigger than any one culture. And that something that is good can be made a vehicle of the holy. And they believe that, and we, we see it today. And I think, as you say, that still has resonance for us. Thank you. We have some really interesting questions that have been sent to us uh, during the presentation. One was a reflection on the number of photos, images you have of medieval iconography in English churches. Uh, in other words, these medieval images survive the Reformation. So do we have any stories of religious spaces being protected during the Reformation? Or was it just by chance that they survived? Um, some of it would be chance, some of it would be, what well, was the miser misericords? There was very little religious imagery there. So they didn't necessarily become a target. Mm -hmm. um, with the root bosses, it might have just been that they were hard to get to, because we know that stained glass was smashed and that paintings were whitewashed. And actually now they're starting to remove whitewash and go, wow, look what's underneath here. Um, so yeah, I suspect with the roof bosses, it probably just had something to do with you know, their physical location. Uh, because we know that so many things were destroyed, um, you know, the chances of actually protecting um, religious imagery in church was probably next to nothing. And we know from important books like The Stripping of the Altars that there were small messages that were often hidden away to show their attachment to the old faith um, with the hopes that they wouldn't be destroyed. Little prayers to the Virgin Mary placed near the gravestone of a, of a deceased member of the family. But as you say, so many of the large images were lost. There's another question now, interesting. Uh, is the concept of mermen purely modern? Or are there any historic examples of men, fish men? There are, actually, really? yes, yes. I didn't include any fish men, but uh, sometimes you find the mermaid and the merman together. And actually, I was looking for an image of a green man and a mermaid to close off. And I couldn't find one, but I did find a green man and a merman carved on a church bench. So yes, I think mermaids appear more often for probably the obvious reason that um, they're kind of appealing, generally speaking. But yes, they're definitely more mermen as well. And here's a question about the, the process of building a medieval church. Um, was all the decoration and the iconography fully planned and designed before the building was started? Or was it done and planned as the building developed in time? I think you probably have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. But one thing that is particularly evident, especially in English churches, is that they were built over really long periods of time. And that's why you'll find a church that has like a Norman crypt and an early Gothic nave, and then they added on you know, a chapel and it's in the high Gothic style. And so you'll have like, you know, four different um, styles. And then of course the Victorians came along and they did some terrible things. One, one of the things I've talked about in my courses is, um, you know, originally all of the, um, all of these sculptures would have been painted. And, and as we've seen, the root bosses really illustrate how colorful you know, churches could be. And we tend to think of um, stone sculpture in churches as being color of stone. But what happened was they, especially in England, I think they stopped painting them because they didn't want to attract any attention. And the view on color is really clear when you, you hear that um, when Christopher Wren was um, working on St. Paul's Cathedral, he wanted the um, ceiling painting in the dome to be in full color, and he was told that was too popish. So it ended up being in gray. In full color would have been a lot better. So gradually, you know, they did. They basically they didn't repaint the stone, and in 
by the time the Victorians came along, any existing paint that was still there, they just got rid of it because they thought it looked better unpainted. So, um, it, it's, it's interesting that we were so used to images, we're surrounded by them and lush colors and the variety of images that we see. It's hard for us to put ourselves in the mind of a European peasant who lived in very simple surroundings with no decorative features to be able to make a pilgrimage to a medieval cathedral and see this massive building looming in front of them, to walk in and to be in this festival of color that they've never seen before in their lives and to be able to move through it and see the whole history of salvation laid out as they make their way from the door up to the altar. And then they could move around and as you say, notice the details. Mm -hmm. Uh, see the small mermaid warning them against sin. See the green man reminding them of the resurrection. I mean, that would have been a feast for the sensation that it's difficult for us who have so many sensations to reconstruct. Um, here's another question, interesting one. You focused on two entities, the mermaid and the green man. Were there other unusual pagan elements that you came across in your research? Uh, well, if I had time, I probably would have included um, more of the um, chimeras, like the, the half human, half beasts, or more of the fabulous beasts. Um, I mean, St. Bernard rails on, he seems particularly annoyed by that whole concept of an animal that is half this and half that. Or one thing you see a lot of is like, um, especially on capitals, is one head and two bodies, or sometimes two heads and one body, or sometimes even three heads. And again, people will say, well, was this just the imagination of, of the carvers? And I think probably to a certain extent there was an imaginative element, but it was definitely not as far as I'm concerned, any kind of a subversive attempt to, I'm just going to bring in back some of my, you know, you know, our, our pagan worship into this context, because, you know, they would have been doing this under the supervision of the church fathers. Um, and of course, so many craftspeople did this as a form of sacrifice. I mean, they took time away from their, right. their other activities to give themselves to this labor-intensive work. Sometimes it went from father to son through families, and they did it as a form of religious devotion. Um, so here's a question. What are your favorite churches and cathedrals and historic buildings? What are some of your must-see places for people planning a holiday in Europe? Big question. Um. Exeter is fabulous. I mean, it's a fabulous cathedral, but it's also a really interesting city. And Westminster Abbey, also fabulous. And um, you have to get the, pay, pay the $20 and get the tour with the verger, because you'll get to see more things. Um, Winchester Cathedral is wonderful as well, because it has the um, Winchester Bible. Um, and it's also one of these cathedrals where there's a section of it that is still Romanesque. Um, and then it goes right up until, I guess, the, you know, the, the high Gothic. And it has a fantastic floor as well. So, so that people need to go have the tour and then go back again to see the details that you can't see in one visit. Yes, yeah, oh my gosh, these churches have so much. Really, it's... Uh, it's a never-ending source of delight. And I don't believe for a sec that you have to be of any particular religious persuasion to enjoy them. Um, you can just enjoy them for what they are. And that doesn't, if you're not a Christian, that doesn't matter in the least. And see them as part of the heritage that has created the people who we are with all our diversity. Um, and to see, as I was saying, that the little personal testimonials that people left. Yes. Um, you know, signs of their own individuality, 
uh, their own struggles, perhaps their own accomplishments, um, that they left as craftspeople, almost like messages through time for us, however we choose to interpret them. Barbara, thank you very much for that. I think we all could see something in that that, um, that touches us, that informs us, inspires us, makes us curious. Thank you to those who are online who've taken time out of your day to join us at the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies. It was good to have you here. And we hope that today's session has piqued your curiosity. The school teaches the languages of most of the places that Barbara mentioned in her presentation. And our arts and science courses have lots of material on visual art, on history, religion, and more. Barbara herself will be teaching in the coming winter semester a course on the history, on the art rather, of Britain, and on the history of art from the 18th century to the 20th century. So from the Rococo up to Andy Warhol. And so please visit our website at learn.utron.ca to see the courses that are available in the winter and to contact us with any questions you have. So thank you again to Barbara. Thank you again to all those who have joined us. And we hope to see you again soon.